Okay, welcome back to the um, second part of the session, Grand Network and Operations. Our first presentation is going to be given by Matthew Wilkinson on the automatically and consistently detecting and extracting SLR measurements for every satellite pass. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Wilkinson. I'm just, we're going to talk about uh, yeah, how to automatically, consistently detect and extract SLR measurements uh, for every satellite pass. Um, so every, every observation begins with the telescope tracking along the predicted path. Uh, the laser fires, short pulses, and the detector is armed for, uh, for return signals. <clears throat> Uh, to, to acquire uh, track, you probably need to align the telescope. Uh, you might need to make corrections to the, to the prediction, uh, uh, either in time bias or, or radially. And then once you've done that, you move on to the next pass and the next pass. But later on, you have to revisit that data and uh, you must do some post-processing to separate the laser, laser range measurements from the background noise. Uh, this separation of signal to noise uh, is made more difficult with weaker, weaker uh, signals, intermittent data flows, and greater back now, background um, noise levels due to sky brightness. So a process of reliably and automatically extracting SLR returns is under development at Hurstmansu and testing. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the, a, a central task manager that, that's been developed to, to automate this process. So I'm going to talk about automatic SLR data reduction, real-time track detection, uh, producing residuals from orbit correction, track selection, return rate filtering, and then finish with the multiprocessing task manager. So why automate uh, track extraction? Well, many SLR stations are automating uh, many of their processes. Uh, some stations are automatically scheduling, some are uh, automatically searching and automatically um, track detecting. Some SLR stations can actually be left unattended to, to track a schedule and, and according to the, uh, uh, the weather conditions. So if such automated systems were allowed to take a final step of submitting data files, then that reduction process does need to be, we need to have a high degree of confidence and, and it needs to be very reliable. Also, if a process is done manually, then it, then it will take some observer time. Uh, and this time, even though it might be very quick, it accumulates over pass by pass, day by day, and year by year. And manual processing must also wait for uh, availability in the observing schedule. And this could be a while, and there's, there's been an increase in SLR targets, and there's been a significant demand on, on the telescope with the recent LARES-2 uh, launch. So uh, this, this talk is, going to, is, 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 about a, is being developed using a, uh, a second event timer, a Riga A033 uh, event timer, which is installed at the SGF in parallel with our system. And also the, uh, at Hurstmansu, we have a kilohertz uh, SLR station. So real-time track detection. Um, when, when the observer is, is tracking uh, uh, a satellite, the, we, we plot the residuals for the observer so they can see what, uh, what, what data is being recorded. Um, and this is, is uh, both, both in, as residuals, but also uh, as a short-term histogram, which is continually uh, refreshed. And track can be identified in real time uh, from a peak above a threshold. Uh, and this track detection has been done at Hersmsu for, 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 for a long time. Uh, when track is detected, residuals are recorded, uh, and then a polynomial is fitted to flatten the returns for easy reduction. Uh, in addition, now, uh, in this new reduction process, track ranges are recorded. So these ranges can be used uh, in an orbit solution to produce residuals, so, in, so not using a polyno polynomial fit. So here's an example for a uh, stellar pass. So this is a, a plot from the Orbit NP software. Um, these are the residuals uh, from, the, from, this, from this orbit, uh, from this CPF prediction. Uh, and then a time bias and, and radial bias and the, the derivatives is, are, are solved for and applied. And that produces flattened uh, residuals. So these, this is not the data set. This is the, 
this is the ranges recorded in real time from, from track detection. In order to get flat residuals, uh, it also requires the past calibration and uh, meteorological records. The Orbit NP software uh, takes epoch and ranges and uh, as an input, it also requires additional information such as the target name, uh, the, the, the day uh, and the CPF, uh, the corresponding CPF prediction. Uh, it, then, it then solves for time bias and, and radial bias, uh, and, these, and these can be output to a file for, for reference. Uh, this software is available to download uh, through the ILRS, ILRS website. So, uh, so the time bias and radial corrections are, are calculated and then output to a file. And so once you have these, these corrections, you can then apply them to the whole data set. And so this, this amount of data then is then applied to the whole data set. Uh, and again, the, the residuals are flattened. So this, this can happen automatically. We've got real-time track detection and then sending, send, putting, those, putting that data into the Orbit NP software and, and, and then producing flattened residuals. So, so that's happening automatically. Uh, but perhaps at this time, but perhaps at this point, you want to take a closer look at what the uh, what the data looks like. And and, and uh, uh, here are some example passes. And at this point, we need to make some decision as to what is satellite track uh, and, and what isn't. So if we take um, this pass for an example, um, just by eye, you can you can see that there are areas that contain satellite track and there are areas that don't. Um, and so I've been developing a method to look at, look at uh, plots like this and consider the relative densities uh, between, of, of points. Um, and that method uses, uh, looks at the, for each point record uh, around zero, uh, uh, look at the nth closest point within a very narrow range of residual window. So, so not really calculating the density, but how far away is the nth point? So maybe it's the 10th point, 15th point, 20th point. Uh, and this, this, this distance will be very short for track and, 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 and it will be longer for, for the random noise in the, in the range gate. Uh, so I can take, that, the, take these values for each point and plot them in a histogram. Uh, and this is the, a, a way of separating signal from noise. So, so you can, this is, uh, this is uh, the end point records uh, from, just from random noise. And then the shorter that interval is, the more likely it is to be track. And that's what, that's what these, this higher uh, part of the histogram is here. Uh, so we're cl clearly managing to separate the signal from noise. And so what we need to do is decide a cutoff point uh, on this histogram. And, and, and that's, then from that point is, is where, uh, for anything lower than that point, is, is, is what could be a, a satellite return. Um, so yes, so, so when we do that and only take the points from uh, below the cutoff point gives us these pink points. And so we've been able to uh, correctly identify the track. And then we can use this uh, to then select around the points and then move on to the next stage of the, of, of the, of the reduction. Here are some other examples. Um, again, this one has a nice peak and there's, and there's a cutoff point and that selects those points there. This one is a, a HEO target, and so that has, it's been, been observed many times. The, the peak isn't as strong, but again, it's the lower points, it's the lower points that, are, that are going to be track, and so if we, the, the cutoff point is here, and then and the, the, the track is selected. Here's a, here is a very difficult daytime pass, probably Etalon, and so you can maybe convince yourself that there is a satellite uh, 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 sort of echoes in, in, in there. Um, and so you must, you know, obviously, as, as, you, as, you, as an observer would, proceed with caution with, this, with these sorts of tracks. There's no, there's no peak uh, to really to pick up on. And so what I do is take the sort of first two, three percent and see, and see uh, how, what, what that gives. And sure enough, it's, it's around the sort of uh, where, where we can maybe think it is. So again, you can go from there. Uh, this pass didn't flatten for some, for some reason, but I've kept it, kept it uh, for interest. And there's, a, there's still a peak. Uh, and from that cutoff point, the data, data comes out. So uh, now to talk about return rate filtering. Um, so at Hurston 2, we're a single, fo we're a single photon station. We uh, uh, adapt, we, we, we restrict our, our return rate in real time using a, a, an ND wheel. 
Uh, but then also in the reduction process, we, we detect high, high areas of return rate and, and remove them uh, and, and, and from the, from the uh, data uh, submission. Traditionally, we've done that by binning data and dividing the track points over the, the number of shots minus the ones beneath the track. At the 20th um, uh, workshop in Potsdam, <coughs> Jose presented a filter method based on Poisson statistics, which considered the time intervals between consecutive points. Um, I've, I've developed a new method for calculating return rate, um, and that's looking at the average time interval between consecutive returns. So for each return, you take the average time interval between the consecutive points for n returns before and n returns after, um, and then you invert this value, and that gives you the number of points per arriving per second. Uh, and then this then converts to uh, return rate by, when you consider the number of shots. And the number of shots is adjusted for any lost points below the track. So this has an advantage that every point is given a return rate value. Uh, here's an example. Uh, so this is a, a, a solid, solid track. Uh, and this is the, uh, the return rate uh, as calculated from a two-second two uh, bin. So it's calculated every second for, with a, with a two-second uh, uh, um, uh, amount of data. And you can see that it's, that, it's, that it's moving along quite steadily, occasionally approaching 10%. However, if we now plot the, uh, the, the new method with, that's calculated with an interval, the return rate actually looks like this. Uh, there's far more, far more spikes, far more um, bursts of, 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 of data uh, that, are, that are being detected. It's difficult to see in that plot um, exactly what's going on. We can zoom in uh, at this level and the, the, the spikes uh, are, are there and that's, and that's the data is sort of stopping and starting. Um, and, and obviously and, and the, uh, the return rate is reaching high, high levels uh, uh, instant, more, more instantaneously and that, that might uh, allow us to reduce certain parts of the, the data more. Uh, and here's another example uh, where the data comes and goes and comes back again. This is the return rate as calculated by the two second bin. Uh, and again, um, the, 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 there are, there's, there's a lot more variability in this, in this new method. Um, uh, with good agreements uh, at lower, lower rates, but then, but then more spikes. Um, so return rates can also be used to filter out areas that do not contain satellite uh, uh, track returns. Um, so you can filter for low levels of return rate, uh, where there's little or no return signal. Uh, however, to do this, rather than use that very spiked uh, 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 profile, a uh, smooth profile is preferable to, so that the data can, can, can be more continuous. Uh, and also, considering the background noise is useful for setting the lower threshold. Um, so the background noise can be calculated by taking the average residual difference from above a point above, from a point above the track, and then, from, and then inverting this, you can, you can uh, determine a, a return rate uh, threshold can be set. So if I, I do this for this, uh, this plot, the, um, this would be the threshold uh, determined from the background noise. Uh, and then here is a smooth profile. And there are areas where it drops below the threshold. And then that would correspond up here. <clears throat> yes, that would correspond to these points being removed uh, due to low return rate. Uh, and, a, and another example, again, the threshold is quite low, but there are areas where the return rate is low, and then these points would be removed uh, for due to low return rate. Uh, so finally, the multi-processing multi task manager is what enables this process to be automated. So this is a Python process, in, process using, program using multi-processing. Uh, the routines are repeatedly run to check for new files and to, and to execute tasks. It runs continuously and prints to the screen as it, as it goes. Um, it's, it's, uh, it writes the MET files, reduces calibrations, writes the calibration pass files, collects uh, track, data, so track files and status files, downloads CPFs, updates the MESA corrections. And then finally, it, re it, will, it can reduce satellite files and, uh, and then it archives the data and the, and the results. Right, just to conclude, um, so automatic data reduction is achievable for the majority and possibly for all SLR passes. Uh, orbit correction is a very stable way to produce flattened residuals. Um, high, rate, high return rate filtering should be carried out on short timescales to remove spikes caused by the atmospheric variability. 
And then future work, uh, we're following some further testing that will we'll start this process to produce normal points. And then a close comparison will be made between the, the, the normal points being produced and for both event timers. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Any questions? Uh, one question. Are you applying the return rate of filter uh, now? No. <coughs> Not yet. Not yet. Uh, do you see any, uh, have you evaluated the impact in terms of uh, range measurement? I, I, um, I, was, I was looking at that and I decided not to include it because I couldn't decide, uh, because if you, if you take the, the, the residuals you've taken out and you can compare their range to the ones, that, to the average of the rest, but I wasn't sure whether to, to consider the residuals values or, I'm, I'm, because, because they still have the spread of, of the tail, so actually they're not, they still get biased up high. Um, so I, I, I wasn't sure that the best way to look at it. I might have to take an average of both kept and not, and then, and then look at the difference there. Uh, so, but, but I think it should be negative, shouldn't it, if it's, if it's high rate. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Um, yeah, I was wondering with respect to the orbit cleaning, how does the orbit cleaning process react to, for example, satellite signature or rotating targets? I mean, is it possible to use this orbit cleaning routine for such targets? Um, <coughs> I, uh, we would, we, it would, it obviously can't, it doesn't include rotating as, as it wouldn't try to flatten that, but it, but it would, but it would probably, uh, give you a, a, a reasonable uh, curve through the through the whole thing, um, but uh, uh, it's better. It's more real than than anything a polynomial will give you if you can get it to work properly. And the second question: How about time? How do, how long does it take relative to I don't know longer longer passes, for example, for your software to clean one pass? And also connected to that. There, is there some, let's say, manual checking involved afterwards, after you cleaned those passes? Because I suppose there might be some passes oh, yeah. which are simply not automatically cleanable. Yeah, exactly. It, it, and and I, that's what I've been dealing with because I'm, I, I'm, I'm running it manually at the moment. And, but yes, there'll have to be some sort of oversight. Um, in terms of time, uh, some long passes can take quite a while because there are, there are a couple of stages that, 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 I, that I can't find a fast way to do it. So, but it, but it's, if it's, it's, if it's happening automatically, then it's happening sort of behind the scenes, and so it's still quicker in, those, in that respect. Thanks. Um, so a quick question about um, the spikes that you see in return rate. Yeah. That's something I've always wondered about single photon systems, because we rely on the fact that it's um, a completely random process to avoid the first photon bias. So do you, do you think that um, even though we have on average less than 10% return rate, that we're actually still getting first photon bias? Um, yeah, you, you, you definitely are, but, but, but what proportion is the single photon, what proportion is multiple, that's, you're always going to have, there's always going to be the danger of that happening, but then you, you want the, the majority to be on the, on the single photon level. Um, if there are spikes like that, then, then, then perhaps we need to reconsider it. Um, I think may, I've been thinking that perhaps we, we could, instead of, as well as the ND filter, perhaps diverge the beam a little bit, which would reduce the return rate and stop the jitter from happening uh, as much. And that might be a good way to sort, sort of uh, uh, handle it. So, um, sorry, go. Um, what I've always wondered is, when we do get a return, mm. is that because mm. the atmosphere is um, configured in such a way that we're actually getting many returns in that <coughs> moment? Do you, do you see what, I'm, what I mean? The, 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 you know, the, the, when, especially when the beam is very, is, is very tightly focused, then turbulence is moving it around and, 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 and you'll get, you get variability in, in, in your signal. And so, so, yeah, uh, there's a lot of stops, stops and starts, uh, I think. 
Any other questions from the audience in the front? Some on the other side. Do we have anything online? Right here? We do? Okay. Um, who is right up? Hey, uh, one question. Uh, the filter algorithms uh, can be used for real-time filtering or only if, uh, for post-processing uh, post purpose? Real-time filtering? Yeah. Um, I, I haven't considered the which the return rate filtering or the or the uh, the data selection. The 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 filtering algorithms to to get the real uh, tracking data for, uh, from the noise uh, to uh, to extract the noise. Yeah. This is uh, uh, only for uh, post processing process or can be used mm -hmm. or adapted these algorithms to you to to use in real time. Uh, quick. Well, I I suggest you talk to our, the Gratz colleagues because they they I think. It should, at least historically, they did look for points that were that were appearing close together and and select in real time. At Hurstman we don't do that. Okay, okay. thank you. And, and the, the filter algorithms uh, will be available to to use with uh, your, for example, Orbit MP software or other software for the future. Um, I, I, I'm going to consider that, well, but but I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Now we have two questions from the audience, from the online audience. Uh, Frank Lamoy wants to know: Map for orbit correction are CPFs sufficient, or do you need a better orbit? CPFs are great, and I, I can I can switch out the CPF from one to the other and, and get more, more or less the same results most, most, for most most of the time. And Daniel Hamps says, uh, Matt, sorry, he didn't get how you calculate the distance of the points to each other. Is the distance in X or Y or both? Uh, both. So, so the, the, the value that I plot is in, is in epoch, but I only consider a narrow window in, in Y. Thank you. <laughs>